Okay. Uh, just right up front, I just want to go ahead and get this out of the way. Uh, my name is Crimson Fist. I dress up like a superhero and I fight crime. Uh, now, I understand that that's weird as shit. Uh, so, if you guys have questions about any of that, we can talk about it at the end. But for the next 20 minutes, let's pretend that superhero is like a normal career path for someone to, to choose. Can we, is that cool with everybody? Cool. Okay. So what we're going to talk about today is uh, the use of technology and data analysis to try and predict crimes and stop them before they happen. Um, how I got interested in this subject uh, was I, I started doing this about nine years ago, uh, and you know I had a little more than just a costume and a, and a pocket full of good intentions. Uh, you know I didn't have a plan. I didn't really know what I was doing at all. I just uh, I picked a big part of Atlanta. Uh, which you can see here, this is pretty much in the red square is all of downtown Atlanta for the most part. Uh, right down uh, down underneath the square there is our local hacker space. If anybody's familiar with Atlanta, this kind of give you a good uh, gauge for it. So everything between Freeside Atlanta all the way up to Piedmont Park, basically. It's about three or four square miles. And so what I would do uh, on any given control is I would just pick an area in the, inside that square control there for six or seven hours over the course of the night and just kind of hope for the best, hope that something happened and I was able to help people. Uh, and that works sort of well, but not really well at all. I, you know, I control three nights a week, 52 weeks a year, um, and I'd say I probably ran into about like three crimes in progress on average every year. Uh, so I didn't like the way the system worked. Uh, and I decided that, you know, having, you know, I, I have been a hacker for most of my life, so I was like, okay, I've got to figure out what the problem is and how I can actually make this thing work for me. Uh, so the first, the first step that I had was uh, I decided that instead of controlling this gigantic area, uh, and you know, where I, depending on where I was, I didn't really know anything about the area. You know, I could tell you, you know, what street led to where, but I couldn't tell you anything about the people that lived there or what was normal behavior for folks there and what was abnormal behavior for people. So I decided instead that I was going to pick just one small area at a time and patrol there every night until it got to the point where I knew everything there was to know about that area. So the past two years I've patrolled this little section downtown it's called Castlebury Hill. It's about four or five square blocks. Uh, and in the two years that I've been there, I now know 95% of the people that live and work in the neighborhood. Uh, I know every little secret shortcut, everything about it. Uh, and so I use that to uh, to be able to, to spot this is, you know, this is, uh, suspicious behavior kind of right off the bat. I know what the neighborhood is usually like, so if anything sticks out, you know, I know to kind of keep an eye on that. Um, and it works better than my original plan, uh, but it's still not perfect. Oh, this is just a second, guys. Sorry, I might have hacked it. I don't have my Wi-Fi on. Uh, so the system works okay as it is, as you see it here, but it was still not not great. Um, but I did start to notice a trend as I was patrolling in this smaller area: is that uh, getting you know getting seen a lot in one place. I kind of developed a reputation in the neighborhood. Word got around it, like yeah. There's this guy dressing like a superhero walking around, and he's actually freaking serious about it. So it got to the point where, you know, if I was on patrol, and I, you know, you'd see two guys walking down the street, they'd be, you know, looking through the windows of cars, every car, they'd check the windows and see if there's anything good inside. Uh, and then they'd see me, and they'd turn around and they'd leave. And so I said, well, that, that's exactly what I want to do. Like, I don't, I don't want to have to actually, like, fight people if I can help it. Uh, so, if I could just make that happen every time, it'd be awesome. Uh, but in order to do that, I have to know where the crime's going to happen. You know, I've got a pretty good intuition just knowing the neighborhood, but I have to, I have, to have better data to really know where things are going to happen and when they're going to happen. Uh, but I kind of thought that, you know, that's, that's science fiction stuff. You know, there's no way that I can really have a, an idea of officially where things are going to happen. Uh, but it turns out I was, I was wrong, and that was when uh, I came across this, which is called PREDPOL. PREDPOL stands for Predictive Policing. Uh, and it's, it's an actual uh, uh, service that's offered to police forces. We use it in Atlanta uh, that does exactly what I said. You know, it, it takes all their data from all the police reports, 
and puts a display up in the officer's car that says, hey, if you're not doing anything, go to one of these little red squares, because this is where a crime is most likely to occur at this exact moment right now. Um, so between calls, the cops in Atlanta or any of the other cities that use it, they'll just drive, they'll park there. Uh, each of these squares is about 500 feet by 500 feet. Uh, and they'll park there, and you know, the, in Atlanta, they, they report a success rate of uh, about 18% uh, increase in crimes that are just prevented before they start. Uh, so that's really cool, and I really wanted to get access to it. Uh, of course, it's made for the police force, so you kind of have to be in the police force to get access to it. Uh, and even if I could get access to it, it costs like three of my house to just have it for a year. So I said, okay, well, I can't have Fred Bowl, but uh, I, I bet I could probably make something that's pretty darn close. Uh, and I, so I decided what I was going to do, I'm not a very technical guy, uh, so I decided what I was going to do is I was going to try and make this uh, using nothing but freely available public uh, websites, software, things like that. Uh, and so I had to figure out, first of all, what was, uh, what were the steps that it was going to take to, to make something like this. Uh, and so I figured what I need to do first and foremost is uh, I need to have the actual raw data. I need the crime statistics that I can, that I can uh, look at from different variables. And I need a way of basically making the map. You know, I need a way to take the data and, and have it tell me where I need to be going. Uh, so what I started with, I went right to the source for as far as my crime data, and I went to the Atlanta Police website. Uh, I love out in Atlanta that they have this nice mapping system where they put all the reports online so you can access it however you want. And I said to me, well, that's cool, but the more I looked at it, it uh, the map kind of sucks. You know, you can really only look at things from one variable. Uh, oh, let me get the back. Get the back. There we go. Um, sorry. Uh, so, at what you can see on the map here, over on the, uh, the right-hand side, you've got little check boxes. You can check off whatever kind of crime you want to search for. Uh, and then underneath it, you can set uh, a, a date range. So, you know, I think they give you, you can look up to uh, a range of up to 60 days to see all the crime that happened in that particular area. Uh, and when you go in uh, to each of the little dots you click, it gives you some further details about the crime. Which is cool if you're just the average person who's, you know, maybe looking to buy a house and maybe you want to see how it is. But for me, I needed, uh, I needed to be able to look at that data from four or five different angles in order to really figure out what the trends are. Uh, so this is where the process gets really, really uh, crappy. Uh, and I basically had to go through uh, and click all those dots and hand copy and paste all the information into a spreadsheet. Uh, and as of right now, I've got about four and a half years worth of uh, crime data from APD that I use in my, uh, in my maps. Uh, but I copy them into a spreadsheet that looks something like this. So you can see I've got, uh, you know, the, the day, the day of the week, the type of crime, the address, uh, and then some extra data that I just need in order to be able to map it. Uh, the downside being that the Atlanta police doesn't, they don't list the day of the week that the crime occurred. So after I compiled all the data from the website, I then have to go through and look up what the actual day of the week that particular date stick out correlates to. Uh, so all in all, you know, when I sit down and, and update my maps, it takes me probably a good three hours to get all the data, the new data that's on the website, and then go through and, and add everything to it. But once I have it, then the process is pretty painless after that point. Um, now I use a website called Batch Geo, which is uh, it's a free service. I, I think they do have a paid service you can, you can get to you know, save your maps and things like that. But basically, with Batch Geo, you take a spreadsheet that has the information, like I said, you, uh, you upload it, and it maps out all the points of data for you. So what we're looking at here, I decided when I was putting the slides together that since I'm talking on a Friday, I basically just pretend like I was getting ready for a Friday night patrol. Um, so what we're looking at here, this is uh, looking at things through a time variable. Uh, you know, I should probably explain one thing. Going back here very quick. Uh, if you see over in column F there, it says watch. Uh, the watch is basically the closest I can get to the accurate time of, of the crime. Uh, 
Um, and then and it basically is just the, the, uh, the shift that the officer was on when he wrote the report for the crime. So in Atlanta, we have three different watches. You have day watch, uh, morning watch, and evening watch. Uh, and I generally control during the morning watch, which runs from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. Um, I'm usually done by about 3 or 4 in the morning, but that's the time frame I follow here. Uh, so what we're looking at on the map here, this is every crime that happened during the morning watch in, uh, this is 2013. Uh, so, I get all the, the points here on this map. I make another map looking at things from another variable. Uh, in this case, uh, I look at the day of the week. So I've got my, my time variable, then I look for every crime that happened on a Friday through the whole year, make a map of that, and then I go through and basically uh, make print poll. Uh, I use Google Map, uh, Google map Engine. Uh, and I go through the, the, the maps as we saw before and find anything where there's a cluster of crimes within about 50 meters of one another. And then I go through and just add a little block to the, the map here. Uh, and there's, there's different layers that I do. So I have the, the layer you're looking at here is uh, specifically crimes that happen during the morning watch. I create a new layer that's specifically crimes that happen during Friday night. Uh, and then I can, you know, make layer upon layer for whatever variables I want to look at. For this example, we're just going to use those two because that's actually the parameters that Predator uses. Uh, but I could look at, you know, any of any of the stuff you saw in the spreadsheet. I can make this for that and compile them together. So once I have all my layers put together, uh, it's pretty much as simple as just tossing them on top of one another. Um, so you can see, you know, I'm going to see if I can get this to pick up my voice over here. Um, probably not. But you can see, like here, we have spots that overlap. Uh, now, up here, we have spots that overlap. Down here, we have a spot that overlaps. So, looking at that, I know that when I'm planning my patrols uh, at the beginning of the night, that those are the places that I need to make sure I'm in more often. Uh, and usually, what I'll do is, is very similar to the police. I'll just I'll have my route go around, and when I hit one of the spots, I'll stay there for about 15, maybe 20 minutes, just you know, step out of the street light, make myself very visible, so that anybody who wants to come through will, you know, it's it's not easy to miss me if I'm standing out there. Uh, and then, of course, after 20 minutes, move on, stop the next place a little while later, things like that. And uh, the weird thing about it is that it, it actually works really well. Um, a lot better than I thought it was. You know, I started doing this just kind of on a fluke. Uh, you know, the, I used to do the, the previous maps, and then I just came up with this idea, and I was like, okay, I'll give it a try and see if it works. And I'd say that in the six months that I've been doing this, um, you know, I went from you know running into a crime maybe every five or six patrols to now I, I run into something happening every every other night, um, and uh, it, and it's. I've kind of become obsessed with it since that point. So um, I've, I've just been developing maps for everything. Uh, so for example, like this here, this is a map of every shortcut in the neighborhood. So every little place that I could sneak through to get to somewhere quicker, or every place that a criminal is going to try and get through to get to one of those spots. Uh, so you know, if I see something that correlates with one of the shortcuts on my, my prediction map, I know that if I hang out right there where that shortcut enters the square, that's where I'm most likely to see somebody coming through to try and do something. Um, some other stuff I'm working on that I don't have, I don't have a slide for it, uh, is uh, I'm working on a system uh, where I'm, I'm going around the neighborhood, I'm getting, uh, I'm mapping out every security camera we have in the neighborhood, uh, which direction they're facing, and then I'm talking, I'm working on, on talking to the, the people who own the cameras and finding out exactly what range those cameras cover. So effectively, we'll have a uh, community-provided closed-circuit uh, neighborhood watch. So anything that happens in the neighborhood, if we know the time, we can go back and I can say, okay, well, if it happened there, this person's camera probably has something, this person's camera probably has something, and we can get whatever data we can get from there and hopefully you know, catch the people that did it, even if we can stop them before it happened. Um, and I think that's my last slide. Uh, but, the one problem I run into is, like I said before, I, I I'm not a technical person. You know, I, like I said, I do all this by copying and pasting everything, and that's why uh, I wanted to present this to a crowd like you guys, because you seem to know a thing or two about like computers. Uh, 
And I feel like a, a, a system like this, that if it were automated and, and easier for people to use, could be used by anyone, anywhere. Um, you know, right now, I mean, like I said, credit pole costs an arm and a leg for people to use, and there's a lot of police departments that could benefit from it, but that don't have nearly enough resources to actually uh, purchase the, the software. Um, and so, I, you know, I'm here asking you guys if anybody has any ideas that could help uh, make the process more efficient, speed things up to where it's uh, not a three hour process to do, you know, nine or ten different crimes every night. Uh, you know, if anybody has any ideas, I'd love to talk to you after the talk. Uh, thank you guys for coming. So this was a pretty short talk, I take it. Uh, but if anybody has any questions um, about this or about crime or about spandex or whatever, uh, right here. <laughs> Have you tried talking to the police? Are they willing to share any of that data with you directly? Yes and no. Um, the 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 beat officers, the actual patrolmen on the streets, uh, are very open. You know, I, I do a lot of work with them when I'm on patrol. Uh, just in regards of like, if they're searching for somebody and they see me, they'll pass on information to me so I can keep an eye out for them. And vice versa. When you get higher up in the chain of command, the people that would actually be able to approve, you know, giving out that information, they're a lot less. Uh, nice about it, uh, just simply because there's a lot of, especially giving it to a person who does what I do, there's a lot of liability in that regard, but I think that maybe approaching it without this and going and talking to someone, I might be able to have some success with it. So. Uh, my thought was just that from a, a uh, standpoint of uh, uh, automating that mm -hmm. data, that if uh, you could convince them to put uh, more detail on the website or yeah. something so that you could pick it up in an automated fashion, that would be easier for everybody. Yeah. Share it with the general public. Yeah. I, I, I know a few of the IT guys at the police department, so I might have to see if I can pull some strings with them. But. Colonel's have Facebook group. <laughs> yeah, My suggestion, call the bullshit on the liability issue. Seattle Public I, I believe that uh, Atlanta also has an open data um, initiative with like you know civic hackers and sure. things like that and so they would be another excellent resource to both get the data you need out of the city and get <coughs> some help in building out your application and open sourcing it and getting more feedback so I'll connect you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you got a question back there anyway? For those areas that overlap, because I'm from Atlanta, I know kind sure. of where you go, um, what would you say like sticks out in that area? Is it bad lighting? Is it the architecture? Mostly lighting. lighting. Um, you know, the, our, our two worst areas in Castleberry, uh, there's a, an intersection at uh, Fair Street and Walker Street, I don't know if you know, but that's where we get most of our violent crime occurs at that intersection. Um, and one of the things that, that I've noticed through my patrols, and, and I'm trying, I'm working with the, the neighborhood association there to try and get the problem resolved, is that we have, there's a lot of street light, but there's trees right underneath it all down the street. And so when you're, you know, where you park your car or where you walk on the sidewalk is almost pitch black at night. So anybody can go in, do whatever they want, and leave. And actually at that intersection there, you know, we have, APD has a closed circuit camera system in, in place, and yet we still get people shot in, at that intersection right underneath the camera because the camera can't see what's happening there at all. Um, so yeah, lighting is, is, in general, in most places, one of the biggest uh, contributors to crime rates in the area. Um, hi. You've been using this data for six months now? Uh, this, the, the last stuff? Right. Yeah, for about six months. Have you been able to notice any change? In the actual trends themselves? So, or? Has, has it shifted any sense for our presence? But have you been, like, I really like that you're using a lot of data because you can actually tell if you're achieving results. Like, yeah. Um, are you, have you noticed any trends or differences? Since I've started using the, the predictive aspect of it, uh, I still think it's a little too early to notice 
for sure. I mean, I definitely see some things that I, I think are, are, are a change, but I, I still need more data in order to really be able to tell an actual trend. But in general, yes, um, just simply because you can see uh, on the maps areas that used to have a lot of crime are now starting to have less crime and the crime uh, the crime is unfortunately moving, just moving to other areas, which I think will always be a problem, but it's moving to areas where there's a much higher police presence. Uh, so they're actually getting a lot more arrests in those areas because the criminals aren't able to go to where they want to be, so they have to go to where they're gonna get caught. Uh, you know the yes, sir. Uh, next question is, uh, do you have any ideas, you've been in there in a specific area, mm -hmm and been focused on that specific area. What could be done so that, to be honest, you're not needed? You, you do what you do because you feel it's needed. Yeah. What could be done so that you're not necessary? Well, this, that's actually kind of been a goal of mine from the start. You know, I started doing the superhero thing because uh, I believe that it's everyone's responsibility as a member of a community to police themselves. You know, the police have a job and it's important, but actually protecting your community uh, is based is up to you and the people who live there to make the to make an environment that's not conducive to crime. Uh, and that's actually starting to happen in Castlebury Hill uh, in a big way. Uh, you know, we, we, there's a lot more people that are proactive in changing the way that things work in the community so the criminals don't want to come there. You know, uh, a, lo a lot of little things, you know, the lighting thing is, is working on getting fixed, just in general cleaning up the neighborhood, removing graffiti, things like that. Things that, that make it not look like, uh, not look like an area that crime should be committed in, because that's a big part of it, is, is the environment. Okay, thank you. Well, to, 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 to more clearly answer your question, uh, what it would take for something like this to not be necessary is for people to just start doing stuff. Somebody else. You know? Well, not somebody else, everybody else. Everybody. Uh, you know, and, it, and it's not that they have to go out and do what I do, but it's that they have, if everybody does something to help make the community safer, then the community will become safer. The kitty generates it. What, what is your relationship with the police? What is your relationship with the police in that area? I assume that they see you and know you. Yes. Uh, in Castlebury, the cops are, are surprisingly receptive to it. Uh, you know, I, I've been there for about two years, and out of the nine that I've done it, and it's the only time that I've ever had a cop stop me and be like, what are you doing? And I tell them, and they go, oh, okay. And then they drive away. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, and, and I think it's, it's just a, it's a, it speaks to the nature of that particular neighborhood, because it's kind of a, a laid back, artsy neighborhood. Uh, and so, you know, the cop was like, it's Castlebury Hill, why the hell not? <laughs> uh, you've, you've probably seen the phone apps where, uh, uh, People join and participate where they see speed traps and things like that, yeah. and they can they can input the location of a speed trap, and everybody else that subscribes to it can uh, look on that app and say, oh, you know, 10 minutes ago this guy reported there was a speed yeah. trap right there. Um, that kind of a thing might help you if you were to uh, start a site that collected that kind of data yeah. and got people in the community interested in logging on and uh, posting that data. Um, you know, Google Maps uses a, uh, a markup language called KML, mm -hmm. and I've used it to create a lot of maps in my business for putting putting pins on the maps and drawing lines and that sure. kind of thing. It's, it's a fairly simple markup language. It seems like that kind of thing would be uh, probably pretty easy to script so that you could automate that yeah. from a database that you had people voluntarily contributing to. I, I definitely agree. We, we have, in Castleberry, we use a, a service called Nextdoor. Um, ne Nextdoor is basically a, a private social network that just is specifically for like one neighborhood. Um, and so we use that, that's kind of, while we don't have an actual like neighborhood watch, that becomes kind of the, like the neighborhood watch phone tree sort of thing. Uh, so 
that it, it helps to a degree. I definitely think your idea is better, um, just simply because it, it gives a more visual uh, way of looking at things. But Nextdoor helps a lot. Uh, you know, in fact, I, I just last night I got an alert on my phone while I was getting ready for bed that somebody got shot, and it was you know. The good thing is, is you know, it, as soon as somebody posts an alert like that, it immediately goes out to everybody who's connected to the network, sends it to their phone, so everybody knows, like, right here we have gunshots, don't go there, you know, or just anything, you know, over here there's a roadblock, don't go there, sort of thing, so. Okay. Yeah, I have uh, a uh, rental property here in the Nashville area mm -hmm. that I have a remotely operated camera on that covers uh, all the features that I need sure. and I've made that available to Homeland Security because there's a target within viewing distance that they would otherwise have to have a warrant for. Mm -hmm. uh, if, um, <laughs> if that's a good way in the neighborhood for the neighbors to share their uh, camera IP addresses. Yeah, yeah that's, the, that's one of the big problems I'm running into uh, with that particular part of the project is that a lot, we have a lot of, of security camera systems in the neighborhood, but probably about 90% of them are not connected to the outside world. Okay. Uh, the, the few that we do have that, uh, that anyone can access, they, they have been really great about just kind of letting anybody, you know, log in to see what's happening around that particular area. But we're kind of, we're, we're in a work in progress about trying to get, uh, get things a little more tethered together. So. Lighting in public areas was mentioned. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion of the effectiveness of the lighting in public areas at deterring crime or removing crime? Well, let me preface this, this is, is strictly speculative because I don't have any real you know information to go on. But I, I do notice that areas that are well lit have less crime. You know, I mean, that's I can see that just from looking at the maps and comparing it to what I actually see on on the street. The areas where where there's a lot of light, uh, people don't want to break into a car there because everybody can see it happen. Uh, so I, I think that there definitely would be a big correlation to you know when you improve lighting in an area, then it's it may not stop crime 100, percent but it's definitely going to make it less appealing for a criminal. Anyone else? I guess. Cool. Guys, thank you uh, for having me. Uh, it's been a pleasure.